Greetings, everyone, and welcome to tonight's discussion. This is the second in the series, Women and Justice, co-presented by the Brooklyn Public Library's Center for Brooklyn History and the Ms. Foundation for Women. I'm Marcia Eli from the Brooklyn Public Library, the Center for Brooklyn History, and the library's arts and culture team, BPL Presents. This year, the Ms. Foundation for Women celebrates 50 years, which is part of the impetus for this collaborative series. The oldest national public foundation for women, Ms. invests in and strengthens women-led movements to advance social, cultural, and economic change for women. Since 1973, they have invested over $90 million in more than 1,600 organizations. Today, 97% of Ms. Foundation grant making goes to organizations led by women and girls of color. You can find out more about their work by going to the link in the chat. We have an amazing group of thinkers joining us this evening. Um, you can explore some of their published work by going to the links being posted. In a moment, I'm excited to introduce our phenomenal moderator, but first, a few quick notes for you. You have the option to use closed captioning tonight. You can activate that through the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please share your questions. Type them into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Finally, one of our pan panelists, Mary Catherine Nagel, very unfortunately has a last minute emergency um, and will not be able to join us. I know she's very sad and so are we. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome our moderator, Tressy McMillan Cotton, New York Times columnist, 2020 MacArthur Fellow, Senior Research Professor with the Center for Information, Technology and Public Life at UNC Chapel Hill, whose most recent book, Thick and Other Essays, was shortlisted for the 2019 National Book Award in Nonfiction, and I am proud to say, won the Brooklyn Public Library's annual literary prize. Thank you so much, Tressie, for leading this conversation. Um, I'm very excited to hear where it will go. No more excited than I am, Marcia. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, listen, you can't be more excited to say that about Thick than I was uh, to have heard it. So thank you <laughs> for once again having me back. This is uh, the second of a series of conversations that we've had here uh, in this partnership between the Center uh, for Brooklyn History and uh, the Miss Foundation. Uh, and I'd like to join you in lifting up uh, good health uh, and all good wishes for Mary Catherine uh, Nagel, who will be missed this evening. I'm a huge fan of her work, as I'm sure our panelists are. And so we send out all good wishes uh, to Mary Catherine tonight. Uh, the Center for Brooklyn History continues to explore the past, present, and future intersecting struggle for gender equality and racial justice this evening. Thank you all for joining us as we continue that conversation. We are also celebrating, as Marcia mentioned, Miss Foundation's 50 years of gender advocacy and justice. And boy, oh boy, what an interesting time for us to be having that celebration and conversation. There is no shortage of things for us to be talking about. Two weeks ago, we had a thought-provoking panel about the way history informs every nook and cranny of the present that we inherit and the future that we endow. As we move forward then, it is important that we continue to interrogate the complex nature of how people, power, and struggles for justice intersect, as we well know, at these really unique sites of struggle and opportunity. And so we all know if we signed on for this kind of conversation, we probably already know that this work is not about adding more check boxes, right, to the list of things that we need to do uh, or to a list of identities, but rather about recognizing that there is no liberation without real coalition. And so I'm I'm very excited because our panelists this evening really exemplify what that kind of work looks like. We're joined by Andrea J. Ritchie. Uh, Andrea is a Black lesbian immigrant survivor who has been documenting, 
organizing, advocating, advocating, litigating, and agitating around policing and criminalization of Black women, girls, trans, and gender nonconforming people for the past three decades. Andrea is the author of Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color, and co-author of No More Police, A Case for Abolition, Say Her Name, Resisting Police Brutality Against Black Women, and Queer Injustice, The Criminalization of LGBT People in the United States. She co-founded Interrupting Criminalization with Miriam Kaba, as well as the In Our Names Network, a network of over 20 organizations working to end police violence against Black women, girls, trans, and gender non-conforming people. Uh, we also have with us Teresa C. Younger. Uh, Teresa is an activist, advocate, and renowned public speaker, organizational strategist, and proven leader in the, film, in the philanthropic and policy sectors. Having spent over 20 years on the front lines of some of the most critical bow, uh, battles for comprehensive equity and the elimination of institutionalized oppression, she now serves as the president and CEO of the Miss Foundation for Women, so the name probably sounds more than a little familiar to you this uh, afternoon. And before joining the Miss Foundation for Women, Younger served as the executive director of the Connecticut General Assembly's Permanent Commission on the Status of Women and as executive director of the ACLU of Connecticut, the first African-American and the first woman, woman to hold that position. So thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Hope you are all doing well. And oh. hang in there. <laughs> no, news isn't getting you down these days. <laughs> Doing our best to stay strong. <laughs> stay strong and well. Uh, <laughs> let's start there, by the way. This was actually not a question I had down. But I, I find it's important these days for us to check in. Uh, with each other. Uh, how are you doing these days as the news circulates? The news circulating for all of us is quite a lot, but when it is your professional obligation, I think, to stay involved, not just in the discourse, but in the policy and the well-being of uh, uh, people, right? How are you doing as you watch? Uh, you know, it's a rapid fire. It's not just the court cases. It's how the court cases are impacting people's lives at all of these various intersections. Every time I see, you know, I was uh, with some friends and family just yesterday who are also, uh, a lot of them are activists and um, legal representatives. And like, yeah, we were having this wonderful day and the weather was beautiful and we were there for a celebration. And at the same time, we were talking about, you know, catching a plane to try to go witness um, you know, a court case in California that we were hoping we were going to help um, uh, migrant women at the border um, who had been separated from the children. And at the same time that we were talking about going down for a reproductive justice uh, um, uh, uh, sit in down in Florida when we're talking about, oh my goodness, how do we feel about being good uh, consumer citizens in Florida? And we were talking about like, what does that look like right now? And then we were talking about, so like, how, how are we? right now, how are you doing? Um, <laughs> I love that question and I wanna be brutally honest, it is yes. tough some days, right? And I think that's where I am these days, which is on this verge of seeing that spring is gonna come out, right? That flowers are gonna bloom again and that we are going to see longer days again. And at the same time, knowing that it is always darkest before the light. Mm -hmm. And that's how I'm holding this moment. I'm holding it with the knowledge that um, with, with these challenges will come the rebirth of greater conversations and greater opportunities. And, um, and really hoping that we remember that we don't have to do it all today and that this unfortunate battle that we are fighting is gonna be around for a while. So I'm doing okay, actually, because I know some of those advocates and those who are doing the work all over the country. And I, I have faith and confidence that they will continue to care for themselves and move the ball forward. Yeah. Andrew, how are you doing? Thanks for asking. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna lie. I mean, some days start with tears and today was definitely one of them. And then I went to a garden with uh, Insight Feminists of Color Against Violence co-founder Mimi Kim, who's been in this struggle since forever since long before I was decades before I was and and we talked about that long history of struggle and also where we see things moving and that we're in a long arc 
where there have been many gains and setbacks and gains and setbacks. And we marveled at, you know, the things that are possible now that weren't possible when we both first started and the things that, you know, are becoming harder and, and how we can draw on the lessons for the past to resist in going into the future. So I think uh, fellowship, sisterhood, communion, communion with nature, um, and conversations like these are the things that keep me going. Yeah. So are you telling us to go touch the grass, Andre? That's what you told me. You're telling me to. You're telling me to touch the grass. That's what I feel like you were just telling me. You know, a, a younger version of me would have been horrified by that, but I think I'm like, yes, go touch the yes, grass. Yes, go touch the grass, Jesse. Go, okay. go see the cherry blossoms at the okay. community garden. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, when you think about the powerhouse of experiences that we have seriously on this call, both organizationally at the interpersonal level, um, various organizational levels, uh, when the two of you look at the big picture, say, you know, you open up the front page of the newspaper or whatever the news looks like this day, these days. And then, however, when you look at the small picture, the people that you actually talk to, from your perspectives, your various places in the world, what does the fight for gender equity look like today from your perspective? Yeah, what is pressing down on us, you think? Um, uh, and at the, you know, there's the big picture stuff. So I think we kind of know uh, what some of that is, but maybe we don't. And, you, and there's something that you wish you, th you thought people were talking about a bit more and does it look a little differently when you are speaking to individual people on the ground? I'm going to let Andrea take this first because I think she's put so much quality thought into being engaged with the activists on the on the ground and in the reflections in her writings. So I'd love to hear her response and then I'll pretend to respond with something of, of brilliance. <laughs> I was literally thinking the same thing. So Teresa is, uh, I'm a fan of both of these folks and, and uh, could not be more honored and excited to be in conversation with both of my sister. And so thank you for inviting me to the Center for Brooklyn History. Um, I think for me, the big from the big picture perspective, uh, the fight for gender equity looks like interrupting criminalization. And that's why Mariam and I co-founded an initiative that has that at its center. Because for me, as long as a million women are in a cage or under some form of correctional control, as long as one in two black trans women face incarceration in their lifetimes, and women, particularly Black and Indigenous women, I, and I wish that um, yeah. our other sister was here to tell us, but as, you know, as particularly Black and Indigenous women are the fastest growing prison and jail population, outpacing the growth in men's incarceration by 50%. Like there just can't be gender equity, especially mm -hmm. if a significant proportion of the people behind bars and prisons for women are survivors of violence many of whom are criminalized for acting in self-defense or defense of others or for actions related to having the highest rates of poverty um, in the country among any demographic group. So I think for me, that is one of the biggest barriers because it places people who are criminalized at risk of police violence, at risk of community violence, at risk of violence in prisons and immigration detention, mm -hmm. including sexual violence. I think also because it mass incarceration poses such incredible economic burdens on women and trans people yeah. who are often supporting loved ones who are incarcerated, sometimes when they're themselves behind bars, putting books, money on other people's books. Um, and so there's lots of data from the SE Justice Group about kind of the emotional, psychological, physical, economic impacts of absorbing the financial costs of mass incarceration that fall primarily on women and trans folks. Um, and I think there just can't be gender equity as long as our almost exclusive reliance on policing and punishment to address violence leaves the vast majority of survivors just out of the equation because they can't access those systems for so many reasons. And when they do, it's so harmful when they do. So I think that's kind of the big picture is looking at the ways in which also policing just robs our communities of the things that are essential to gender equity, like quality education, housing, healthcare, income support. Like you literally have the mayor of New York saying, we have to cut teachers because we have to increase the police budget. It's like literally taking, like literally yeah. taking the things- A one to one, yeah. Exactly, yeah. like taking the things that survivors say they need housing and saying, you can't have that because <laughs> we're going to give you this other thing that's going to hurt you or in one way or another. Mm -hmm. I think for me, that's the big picture. And then taking it down to the community level, that means that it 
we need the fight for gender equity is fighting for divestment from harmful systems and investment in the things that Black women, Indigenous women, queer and trans people say they need, housing, health care, income support, immigration status, education opportunity, not family separation, but family unification, family supports. And the last thing I'll say is I think it means that all of us have to commit to gaining and developing the skills and capacities to show up for each other and for survivors, to build the kinds of relationships that will build the kind of community safety net that'll help us survive what's going on now and what's to come, and to really actually meet the needs of people who are experiencing these massive inequities and, and take responsibility for shifting them ourselves. So that's what I see at the big picture. And then all that seems like too much for one person to do, but I think there's every day we can practice something that'll bring us closer to equity um, if we're committed to it. Yeah. 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 Say I told you, you just, uh, everything ditto everything she said oh, yeah uh, yeah you know I've been uh, I've been out on a listening tour as part of the 50th anniversary of the Ms. Foundation and we've been asking this question how do we create the world we deserve mm -hmm. and so when I hear Andrea talk and I reflect on this question I reflect on you know the reality that we deserve dignity and humanity, and love, and joy. We deserve those things. And when I think of gender equity, I think of all of those words, because it means you get to show up in your fullest self. You do not have to be fit into the boxes and the and the and conform into those boxes of expectation around gender binary and like what that looks like and continuing to push outside of the parameters we are not and i know this came up in the last conversation we no longer have to apply for jobs by gender uh, mm -hmm. and that that gender has to be either male or female right man or woman or mever, however we do it we actually can uh live into our own best self and andrea hit on what i think is uh you know in this country not all over the globe necessarily but in this country is one of the greatest um uh stealers of our own human dignity which is a criminal justice system and a policing system that is based on a militarization in this country which makes an assumption that there is an enemy of the people instead of an inclusion of the people in the work that we are doing and the trickle down of taking people and placing them in a criminal justice system that does not respect them give them dignity or humanity also means that we have and in most cases, it tends to be women who are having to carry the burden of not just what is happening, uh, the criminalization of our bodies, but the bodies of our loved ones. And thus going to the second level, the economic downplay of that. I serve, uh, Andrea mentioned this, but if you want data, we no longer have to speculate about the impact of these systems on uh, women and girls, gender non-conforming, trans, our trans siblings, we no longer have to speculate it. We have the data. SE Justice Group did a, a, a survey that said one in four women have a formerly incarcerated loved formerly incarcerated loved woman, loved one. And women, black women have are one in two likely to have a formerly incarcerated incarcerated loved one like these are real numbers these are our hearts being pulled into systems that are not about building them up into the future and also do not allow us to talk about the violence that happens to us without it be being a criminal penalty we can't look at what restorative justice looks like if everything is a is predicated on somebody being bad wrong and needing to be taken out of society uh, and you know so so when we react to things, we are bad, wrong, and being taken out of society instead of trying to figure out how do we have these really difficult and challenging conversations about the world we want and we deserve. And it's not always going to be easy, but you don't take people out of society for for what is going on and then expect, you know, that they are going to be able to come back into society without housing, without health care, without food on their table, without educational opportunities and without a job. And so, you know, you can't you can't say we're going to have a capitalist structure and you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but then not show up, not show up with a pair of boots.
And so, you know, when I look at, at gender equity in this country, um, and I say this country because I just got back from Belize and I'm watching what's happening in China and in Taiwan and in so many other countries, our sisters in the, in the, in the South, and, you know, these are very real and different conversations. There are countries in the global world that actually do not criminalize women the way we do in the United States, and particularly Black and brown women um, the way we do in the United States. Um, my sociology colleague, Jess Clarko, uh, likes to say that in every other developed nation uh, has a social safety net. In the United States, we have we instead have women. Uh, you know, they've chosen to have a safety net and we have chosen instead to have women. Uh, and when you choose to have women as uh, your basic social safety net in uh, a very brutal capitalist structure, that's who you also choose to punish when capitalism isn't working. <laughs> right. And this is fundamentally, I think, what we see happening, why you don't see it, to your point, when you are traveling around the world, why you don't see that same brutality, brutality happening to women elsewhere. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it's striking to me. We're having this conversation and I was just listening to you, Teresa. The, the thing that I was, the event that I was attending yesterday was in support of a book called Comrade Sisters, which was celebrating the women of the Black Panther Party. And um, I was there because uh, my mother is one of the women in the book and she was on the panel with Erica Huggins and some of her other old comrade sisters. And the thing they wanted to talk about over and over again that was heartbreaking to them was how much of what they had fought for they were still seeing on the news today. And the stories that they kept talking about, Erica, of course, whose husband had been um, uh, uh, killed by the police and all they wanted to talk about was police brutality that they had suffered. They wanted to talk about that that's what it brought them into the movement when they were young girls. Um, and it was remarkable to hear their stories, uh, how much criminalization had been responsible for their awakening and radicalization. Uh, 40 years ago, and how present it still felt to them, and for us to be having this conversation uh, tonight. And it's just, uh, I just felt a collapse of time as we were sitting uh, here talking. Um, well, we we have to talk about uh, what I think was as we're talking about the radicalization. I think particularly uh, for so many, um, both young women um, and young uh, gender nonconforming people, um, who are terrified right now about the state of reproductive health. And I think uh, for a lot of people who are perhaps were not already radicalized by things like uh, criminalization, <laughs> the state of capitalism, um, that this has been a moment for many of them. Um, if they are finding themselves radicalized for the first time, how might we talk to them for those of us who have been talking about this sometimes for a long time? And so it can be difficult to remember maybe our 101 you know, how do we talk about getting in the game if this if if one is new uh, to their uh, awakening uh, to this moment? Um, how do we talk about getting in the game right now? Uh, if the history is uh, new to people, um, I think in this moment we have to sort of you know seize the day for people who are coming to the uh, to the table perhaps for the first time or with a very new. Um, sort of awareness. Um, you've been around the country listening to people who perhaps are doing that kind of work. And I know you, Andre, I think is this is your bread and butter, writing guides for those of us uh, to guide them through uh, the wilderness of how to come to the table. How can those of us who don't think about it every day think about how to help people uh, get in the game? Yeah. Um, so uh, first off, welcome. If, if you are just waking up, if the lights have come on, uh, don't beat yourself up over not having been in the game before. Welcome to the game. Uh, and we need you. Uh, so I would, I would just put that out there as the first. You do not have to know, and this is often, so many of us do this, we have to know all the history and understand all the details in order to play. You don't. What you need to have is your own voice. Know who you are. Educate yourself on what is important to you. You do not have to be out telling everybody else's story. You just have to tell your own. And so I find that that is where we, you know, the idea of everyday feminists, everyday voices being at the table is some of the most critical thing, some of the most critical things we can be doing. So when people say, what do I do? There is something today that we didn't have 
30, 40 years ago. It's called the great Google. And all you have to do is, is take a moment, no more white pages. You take a moment, you type in reproductive justice, understand that that is, a, that is much broader than just abortion and just access to birth control. You have to understand that, you know, pre row and pre dobbs those those determinations those court cases were not actually inclusive of everybody and so we need all of the stories to understand what is going on uh that there is a movement afoot in this country to undermine and continue to criminalize women's bodies uh and bodies in general and that is very realistic so if you're coming on Find one thing you can do, whether it's reading, whether it's volunteering, whether it's, uh, you know, you got a car, drive somebody to a clinic when they have five hours to drive to the clinic. You're a good person and you have time, babysit somebody's kids so that they can go and take care of the things they need to. Uh, train on how to be a moderator so that you can be in the conversations that, that may need somebody to just listen and to validate what is being said. So, you know, I think you don't, people get in and they're like, okay, I'm gonna do everything. No, actually you don't. Respect those who have been in the field before and ask how you can help. And that's some of the best advice that I would give, but welcome. If you have not been doing any work in the space around activism and you're kind of waking up to it, welcome to it. Don't let it override you and don't let it uh, eat you because it can, but, uh, but welcome to the fight and help us all join an arm in arm to start lending voice and telling real story to what's going on. I mean, I would just a thousand percent echo what um, Teresa just said, you know, this, I think there's been this sort of um, kind of delegation of responsibility for dealing with the issues of our time, either to nonprofits or community organizations or to lawyers, uh, as, I, as a lawyer, we have no, the, the solution is not in the courts. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we just sort of delegate, you know, to elected officials, to a whole kinds of people kind of resolving these issues. And, and I think it's, it, we're, none of this is going to change unless all of us get involved. We're at a moment where there are competing visions of the future contending for the future in this moment, and they are radically different. And if we want the future that we want, we need to get in and fight for it because there are other people fighting for their vision of the future quite vehemently. And so um, there's no more delegation. <laughs> if that was what you were doing, uh, no, now we all need to get in. And I think there's so many ways to do it. You know, I, I think it is a question of looking around and seeing what people are already doing um, and not sort of trying to reinvent the wheel. I saw people when the Dobbs decision came down sort of acting like they had were the first people who had thought of an abortion fund. Yeah. <laughs> news, yeah. news, news flash because of what uh, Teresa just said for the fact that since I have been aware and that is, you know, uh, shortly around the time that um, uh, Roe was decided, there have been people who have been excluded from the protections such as they were of Roe, including migrants, including um, indigenous women, including so many people. And so there's a national network of abortion funds that's been building a web of support and doing and creating opportunities to enter into the kind of action that Teresa just talked about. So the first thing you should do Donate to your abortion fund, find out your local abortion fund, get involved in your local abortion fund. You can do what I did in, um, I don't care what year it was, but when, when um, Planned Parenthood v. Casey was up and we were like, oh, we're yeah. going to lose Roe then. Yeah. I learned how to perform an abortion. You don't need to do that anymore, but you can become an abortion doula to yeah. support people through whatever procedure they're doing. So mm -hmm. just understand that you can shape the world through your actions. Um, and then I would say, you know, just to not repeat the same thing, but interrupting criminalization is the answer, right? Mm -hmm. Criminalization denies people access to all the things that, that Teresa just described in the world, to reproductive and gender affirming health care. You can't get an abortion, even if you're in a state that allows it, if you're incarcerated, if if you're on in immigration detention, if you're on probation or parole and your movements are restricted, you can't do it. You can't afford it. Um, mm -hmm. So it can't always be about um, moving or just going to the blue state. It has to be about supporting people and fighting where they are. 
Um, and I think the same is very much true for parents and families of trans young people and connecting those two struggles. So I would really invite people to think about the fact that it's not just about abortion. It's not just about gender affirming care. Those two things are very much connected, not only through sometimes the same medications, but also through the same agenda on the other side that they're fighting for. Right, right. Control yeah. over yeah. our bodies yeah. and control over our gender self-determination, yeah. our sexual self-determination, our economic self-determination, all the things that we talked about having won. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and then if you're a healthcare provider, I just want to say, and you want, or you want to support healthcare providers in resisting criminalization, we've created a network at interrupting criminalization called the Beyond Do No Harm Network. So calling healthcare providers into their commitment to do no harm and go beyond it to make sure that people are able to access all the kinds of care that they need in this moment without fear of criminalization. So um, mm -hmm. invite folks to join and then just to join in your local struggle to, to really do anything. If, if the library is struggling in your community to keep books on the shelf, go to the library. If your school you. is, if people on the, in the school board are trying to control what students learn or can't, then go, go to, to the school board, board meeting. If, Thank if, you. If, yeah. if your, your local <laughs> park commission is doing something messy, sweeping homeless go people, to the <laughs> meeting. <laughs> go, out, go out when they're sweeping homeless people, help yeah. homeless people move their, or unhoused people move their things or interrupt the sweeps if you can, but at a minimum document so that you can then go and tell and fight. I mean, yeah. just find anywhere people are fighting and join in. Join mm -hmm. in with humility. Look around, see what people are doing, see what's needed, ask yeah. what's needed. Don't come in thinking you have all the answers, but together we need to be fighting for the futures that we really are deserve, frankly, mm -hmm. and are dreaming yeah. of. Join yeah. in with humility. I love that. If I you know, was the tattoos, I would get that one. <laughs> you know, the other thing that I would just say is that, um, the world is more complex than the world you're living in, you know? And so, you know, recognize that in some states, the state is actually the parent for young people. And so, you know, if you have a half a day and you can go testify somewhere, go testify somewhere, you know, make sure that uh, that our the states, we can't all live in New York, um, which has its own set of problems, but, you know, where can we live and have impact and support what's going on, you know, right after Dobbs, and I know Andrea knows this well, there was a real concern about states that are the parents of children because they have been taken from their families or whatever is going on. And those states are parenting uh, young people in ways that are harmful to those young people. And so we need to make sure that those voices get heard and, and those young people are protected so that they can grow up and be uh, citizens and respected for the voices that they bring to the table. So I, I just, I encourage people to make sure you show up Sometimes you show up with humility. Sometimes you just need to show up. And sometimes you need to show up and speak up and speak on your behalf, not everybody else's. That's really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have questions coming in. Thank you so much for those. And I'm actually going to uh, um, do, take a little uh, moder moderated privilege here and pivot to those um, because we have a few and I'd like to privilege the uh, Q&A. So our first question is from Bel uh, Belinda and I think the timing on this is excellent. So uh, Belinda asks, can the panelists share insight or experiences um, of spaces where women are coming together in solidarity. Part of what has been difficult uh, to me, Belinda says, in gender equity is racial and wealth divisions within the gender umbrella. I mean, yeah, this is a, you know, this is a long standing thing, right? Um, uh, different understandings about, uh, I think, uh, um, I think Teresa's point, uh, you just kind of hit on this, like, you know, we're not all in New York and like, we're not all looking at the world from standing in the same place um, and race and wealth and the intersections of those can have significant <laughs> uh, impacts on how, on what we think uh, inclusion and equity and belonging and they shape our priorities, they shape what we think is enough like, right, when winning has gone far enough, when we have included enough. Um, and so can we talk about, um, I think, both the difficulties of that and um, spaces where you think maybe we're, we're getting it close to right? I feel like you have a bird's eye view of that, Teresa. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think uh, sometimes we are 
Well, first up, Andrea is one of the best organizers out there. Take a look at some of the websites and the things that have been, I mean, I've known Andrea only only eight or nine years, but uh, every time uh, she's putting out something, I see people taking action. Um, and so, you know, what I always say is set your table, invite your friends to the table, have the conversations with the people you are closest to. If you can't be uncomfortable there, you won't be uncomfortable where you need to go. And that way you don't have to go alone. So, you know, yes, have conversations. I, I have many a conversation with wealthy, wealthy white people who want to understand something. I give from a place of generosity in those conversations, but I also have those conversations with my good girlfriends and my good male friends and my good siblings in the world about them. And we recommend, hey, have you seen this? What does this look like? Don't just stay in your comfort zone, get outside of the comfort zone. So, I mean, the list of organizations I can't tell you one that's explicit to another, but mm -hmm. what I would say is you can organize, everybody can be an organizer. So uh, if you are uncomfortable and you don't want to have that conversation at the dinner table again, have that conversation at the dinner table again, and that could have greater impact. Talk about uh, bodily autonomy. Talk about the things that make everybody uncomfortable. Talk about criminalization of our bodies. Talk about um, economic impact of the decisions that are being perpetuated by uh, what the Congress looks like and what uh, and what the courts look like. Know that we cannot rely on any one system, whether it's Congress, the courts, or local or state governments, to be the resolution. So come together locally in your with the people that you know um, within your churches within your reading within your book groups within your libraries and start asking those kinds of questions that's actually the place to start um, and then you can expand out you know uh, I know that there is you know there's the abortion funds they have lots of information out there there's also Planned Parenthood their sister song there are a number of organizations out there that have lists of information go up and do your own research go up and do your own research and then have the conversations with your friends from high school and your friends the the parents of your your children yeah. I you know, I'm oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jesse. No, go ahead. No, no I, I was just gonna say, you know, I think sometimes, Belinda, we worry so much about um, who we need to convince and don't focus enough on the people who did show up. Um, I actually, you know, I, I think sometimes I, our spaces are a little less divided than they, they appear um, at, at first glance. Um, you know, I, sometimes I'm in spaces and just because the people look, similar or they showed up, you know, they self-selected into being there. We assume that they are all alike. Um, and then you spend some time with them and you realize, no, you know, they're the black sheep of the wealthy family. Um, but then that meant that meant they were wealthy. They're just the wealthy person who showed up. And so, you know, that they were the ones who kind of didn't agree with um, you know, their family's uh political um, positions or the, the family's political beliefs. And I just think it matters less sometimes for us to convince uh, the wealthy people who disagree with us or, um, you know, the white power structure or whatever who disagrees with us or what have you. I think the people in the room are the ones who matter. And I think we, you know, we can be a bit um, dismissive when we say, well, then you're preaching to the choir. Or I think the other way to look at that is that you're talking to your comrades and you're organizing with the people who have invested in your space and eventually people who want to be. And if you make that space loving and if you make that space, frankly, fun, this is something I think something like Sister Song does amazing. And so many reproductive justice people make amazing um, that I, I wish more people would touch and see for themselves. Those spaces are very joyful spaces and they're very fun and they're very loving, which is why I think they are so self-sustaining, by the way despite doing very hard work during very difficult times. And it's because when people see them, they're having a really good time. And I think that when um, you make our, when we make our spaces that way, that uh, we don't have to work quite so hard to convince people um, to join us, to do hard, difficult work. I just think sometimes we can get a little obsessed 
um, with bringing people uh, over, <laughs> but that's all I wanted to say. And I think that there are more, I think we're, we have a more diverse coalition sometimes than, than, uh, than we believe we have. And we should maybe stop buying the, um, the opposition's, um, um, uh, assessment of us as being monolithic. I don't think we're nearly as monolithic as, as people say, say that we are far more diverse. And, and that, I think even the data would bear that out. Far more people agree, for example, with uh, access to abortion and with decreasing um, uh, getting rid of prisons uh, than, than disagree. There are far, far more people disagree with banning books than agree with removing them. So, I mean, I mean, statistically, we just are winning and we're more diverse. And yet somehow we think we're the ones who have to convince people. And I just, I don't know. I think we shouldn't believe the opposition, <laughs> that one. Um, so like go forth and believe in ourselves is what I want to say. Um, uh, another question from Anonymous, how can formerly incarcerated women, I think maybe you're saying SIBs might be, I'm not sure about the um, there, trans and non-conforming uh, people contribute to the movement of ending the carceral injustice the system repeatedly places upon our shoulders. Uh, um, Andre, I think perhaps to you. Yeah, I mean, I would say the National Council of Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls is creating a space for currently and formerly incarcerated women, girls, and trans folks to be in leadership of movements to um, end mass incarceration and, and build, um, reimagine their communities. And uh, at Interrupting Criminalization, we've been privileged to partner with the council on multiple initiatives and to really start from the place, and this is this is also where I think where people are thinking about where to start is like what would make women, girls, trans, and gender nonconforming people safer is where to start. And um, if you talk to currently and formerly incarcerated folks, they're going to give that's that's where the knowledge is, and that's where the leadership needs to come from. So we certainly take our leadership from them and their initiatives and um, and support them where we can. So, and I think that is one place where women are coming together in solidarity across race, across uh, multiple gender identities and, and um, sexual identities, and also across uh, immigration detention, prisons, jails, and across the country. And so it's, it's a really beautiful space um, where that's happening. So um, encourage folks to join if they haven't already, they have affiliates across the country um, and, and so many, campaigns to close jails for women and reimagine communities as the kinds of spaces people can thrive in the ways that Teresa was describing earlier. And I would mention that uh, we've been dropping some of those links um, in the chat, um, which may also get to the question. Uh, I've got Julia uh, down below who also asks where to find news about the fights that are going on that are not led by newcomer techies, but that have long roots. Um, and so we've also been dropping some links in the chat that I think may help with both of those questions. Um, Merle had a really big question, um, a complex one that I, don't, I know we won't be able to unpack uh, completely, um, but uh, as both of uh, you put before us that the challenge of criminalization in the broad sense too, by the way, not just talking about prisons, but that sort of whole continuum, everything from, um, I think we would say everything from like the child welfare system uh, to um, surveillance, uh, to um, uh, immigrant detention, to uh, imprisonment, everything, that entire system. Um, uh, Merle asked, who benefits um, from mass incarceration? I mean, I would say the same systems, structures, and institutions that benefited from gender inequity and uh, the oppression of indigenous black and migrant women and queer and trans people throughout the history of this country, right? Those systems are created to manufacture and enforce a certain order that keeps black and indigenous women as the lowest income, most, you know, oppressed. And as you uh, said, so poignantly trustee, the folks who are who are holding the safety net, who are the safety net, who have been the safety net, who have been the people holding our communities together um, and, and the oppression of that group in order to protect uh, wealth accumulation, capital accumulation, 
the billionaires who in a time of pandemic and massive economic crisis are multiplying their billions while we all suffer um, and die under a mass pandemic. And then they convinced us the pandemic is over so they can continue to make their profits. I mean, it's really, um, that's who benefits from mass incarceration. So mass incarceration, mass criminalization are, are just kind of the front lines. They're the enforcers of those systems and they also manufacture and and perpetuate those systems. So the, the it's the same. So white supremacy benefits, capitalism benefits, um, imperialism benefits, and the corporations that uh, not that manufacture tasers and body cameras benefit, and the corporations that make profits off of you know people's labor who are incarcerated, the corporations that build the border fence, the corporations that are building the police training facility in Atlanta that people are resisting. Uh, they, there's a whole web of corporations who are benefiting from that process of destroying the lungs of Atlanta and um, a green space for black communities nearby. Um, it's it's really all traces back to corporate power and white supremacy. So if we want to find our targets, they're everywhere and we can uh, literally work to dismantle and chip away at the system that's benefiting from that, uh, from what, everywhere we are. Yeah, that's a big one. It's a big one that, you know, we all can do our part. If you have a retirement plan, find out where those dollars are going. You know, you're investing in a future, find out where those dollars are going, choose to shop in places that, you know, don't perpetuate some of these systems, ask the question why they're getting started, how they're getting started, hold elected officials accountable for the decisions that they're making, because state governments are profiting off the criminalization of entities, they're taxing back in these uh insane kinds of ways and giving tax breaks to corporations who are perpetuating these things. Everything from phone companies to commissary supplies are being taxed. And and uh, and in when you're in an in the system, it's just continually being perpetuated. I mean there are there are a lot of things that we can do and we need to determine if we're going to live in a capitalist society like the United States, then how are your dollars impacting it now and into the future what's going on? That is a wonderful point. And we talk about uh, sort of individual behaviors um, uh, that we can do. There are those sort of like interpersonal ones that I do, uh, do love for us to think more about. Um, and then there are those like those sort of like consumer ones, right, that, that we um, uh, don't often think about. Um, uh, we all, you know, many of us, yes, you have your 401ks and your employer, you are a student somewhere. I'm at a, I'm an employee at a public university. Um, and, you know, I'm always telling my students uh, to ask their university administrators uh, uh, to consider, uh, to reconsider the use of uh, buying uh, uh, contract, using contracted labor from uh, uh, from state prison labor that builds uh, the furniture that the university purchases, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, as we like to say, follow the money. Uh, and ask where it comes from and where it's being spent. A question from Amaris, where are some of the things, well, what are some of the things uh, that y'all have learned this year pertaining to gender equity? What are some of the things you've learned this year? I love that question because uh, I like the idea of always being a student. So what are some things that you've learned this year? Well, it's a great question. Um, I feel like I'm constantly learning. I don't even know if it was this year, yesterday, or uh -huh. three years ago. <laughs> it all went together at some point. You know what? 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 I have. Uh, I think the thing I was reminded of when I was in uh, Tennessee a couple of weeks ago was that this is an intergenerational struggle. And that uh, the conversation, how we code it now and, and, and talk about it in terms of being gender non-conforming and trans have always been parts of our communities and have been parts of our communities uh, and, and um, historically. And so we, we need to stop treating this as this is a new thing uh, and that we are now in it. Uh, you know, we also, the thing that I learned that was most new this year was that a 17 year old today is the most politically informed uh, of any generation of past. 
because they have grown up with active shooter drills and an understanding of the environment and seeing what's happening in their communities around unhoused uh, people. And I, I, I use all of that as a conversation around gender equity and, and inclusion and equality because they are so much more aware and we cannot rely on just leaving it on their shoulders and walking away, those of us who have been in the battle for a long time, but to invite everybody into the conversation conversation in the battle. And I think I was reminded of that when I was in Tennessee, where there's some, you know, crazy, you know, legislation that was signed by the governor that said, you know, um, drag, uh, drag shows are illegal and you can't read and live drag performers can't read in libraries to little people. And it, it was just like, what's going on here is, you know, that people are trying to distract us from the realities of what humanity and dignity look like by throwing out these other things when we have not, we don't have drinkable water in certain states and certain towns and certain communities. So stay focused. Um, and that is what I am reminded about oftentimes and that it will take all of us. There's no passing the torch, it's all linking arms. Andrea, what have you learned this year? I love that. I love there's no passing the torch. It's all linking arms. Um, I've been uh, working on a, a book coming out this year, hopefully on uh, abolition and emergent strategies. And so I've learned a lot of complexity science, which apparently is about like, because we are all parts of these complex systems and there's a lot to learn about how complex systems change and how change happens within them. And what it taught me most was um, just how important critical connections and networks and communities of practice are to shifting entire systems. Um, that it doesn't, in other words, it doesn't, we don't have to have mass numbers of people in the streets like we did in 2020 to make the kinds of changes we want. There are moments in time where there'll be those flashpoints that'll catapult us forward into new realities. But, and unfortunately, this is also the right knows this and they're doing it very well, that we build the world we want in every interaction that we have. And we, but every, inter, it's not that we just build a commune where we're all happy together and forget the rest of the world, but we do it with the intention of shaping the world around us. And I think that's something that, that Black women and no doubt Indigenous women have been doing for a really long time, is building the world through care and compassion and other mothering and mutual aid and providing for a community and creating the world that the, the rest of the world is denying us in our everyday interactions in our communities in ways that ultimately profoundly shift the whole system. And mm -hmm. so I've learned a lot about how that happens and that and that there's some element kind of a magic to it, but um, which doesn't to say that we're going to count on magic to resist fascism, we're going to organize, but that there's something about the way we build the world relentlessly every day that we want through our interactions, through our communities, through our lives, through our networks that can profoundly shift and does profoundly shift the, the, the larger systems that feel um, kind of unattainable to change and that that's, that's actually how change happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was trying to think, I don't know, I'm, I'm constantly learning. I'm like you two. Um, I think I was just reminded this year of how you just never know what the moment will be that will be the one, right? Like, so like, we know this from like social movements and, you know, people who study these things, you know, one of the um, uh, the not so uh, dirty little secrets of people who study like, like how social movements happen is they like, oh yeah, we can tell you all kinds of stuff, uh, but we can't tell you why they were. <laughs> you know, they're just these like, suddenly it will just work. Uh, people can try and try and try. And, um, you know, that always seems to make them a little sad, but for me, it's actually quite hopeful uh, because it means you never know if this is the day. You just never know if this is the day you're going to get up and the thing that you've been doing every day will suddenly be the day. Um, and uh, so it's like, you know, for many people who have been paying attention for many years, you know, Dobbs was not a surprise, obviously, but it was still, I think, surprisingly sad. I think I think some, some of us uh, talked about it that we got together, you know, shortly after the decision it was like, we were kind of surprised that we were still sad. And, <laughs> despite knowing, you know, we were still a little like, why do I still feel something? Um, and as it turned out, we were still human. And uh, so, you know, we drank to that. And then we were like, well, you know, though, 
you get up every day and maybe this is the day. And, you know, we saw people that we've been talking to forever and suddenly the story you've been telling, the work you've been doing, the art you've been making, it's the day that it mattered to somebody that it, you know, that it did the thing. And I don't know, I've, I've been reminded of that this year because it has been the small moments. I think to your point, Andrea, not the big, you know, it wasn't the march on, um, you know, the women's march, whatever, like as amazing as some of these like massive things are, it has been the smaller moments that for whatever reason have resonated more um, for me and for the people around me. And I think I was just reminded like, oh yeah, you never know when the thing you've done will matter. And that's uh, strangely, oddly hopeful uh, to me. And so uh, I'm uh, relearning that this year. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, thank you very much for that one, um, Amaris. And thank you uh, uh, to my panelists for continuing to share uh, wonderful links in the chat. But for those of you um, uh, who have been following along, if you've missed a couple of there, I think uh, those are wonderful. Um, and then another uh, question, can we really incrementally work our way out of this huge and well-funded and supported economic uh, question, new uh, economic system it says the newbie question is revolution an option? <laughs> and I'll be a final question because I think that's a wonderful to tee up. Is revolution an option? Revolution is always an option. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, it's like option. yes, and yeah. um, uh, and also revolution starts with the small steps first. And so there is no one way or the other. There's going to be multiple ways that we will need to organize and uh, move forward and do what we need to do. And so incremental, there will be steps that will need to be taken incrementally. And then there will also be uh, massive revolutionary steps. We need to come up with us alternative options for what that could look like. And we need to dream abundantly about what that could look like because we actually have not been presented with the model that will be um, inclusive. We have to hold the United States accountable for how it treats its citizens and and how it treats those on its land. Uh, and its land is not a pejorative statement that, that on this mock bordered land we are on that we call the United States, there's a responsibility and we have to hold everybody accountable for those responsibilities. And we cannot get tired. Rest when you can, demand when you can, revolution will come our way and we will need to be prepared to join in to help dream about it and to help get us there. Thank you. I mean, I just also want to honor um, all the ways Ms. Foundation over the past 50 years has supported people in making revolution and, and making a revolution that's brought us closer to gender equity and liberation. So I just want to start there um, and appreciate that. It's such an honor to celebrate those 50 years. And I will say, you know, Black feminism is a revolutionary politic. And if you have any doubt about it, go listen to Barbara Smith's recent lecture at Brooklyn College, uh, What I Believe. And so a world where Black women, girls, and trans people, um, and all of those that we love and all people we're in community with are freed from all of the interlocking systems of oppression that shape and control our lives is a revolutionary future. And certainly abolition is a revolutionary politic. Um, and, and so I think the question is, you know, how do we get there? Yes, it's not going to happen overnight. We made a binder for y'all at Interrupting Criminalization where we sort of like this path is a dead end. This path is a red herring. This path brings us closer. And that's our best roadmap, but make your own. Um, but I think that there's, there's ways to the future that we're looking for in which every one of us has everything we need to achieve our greatest human potential and where black women, girls, trans and gender non-conforming people can freely love and be fully loved and be our fullest, most beautiful selves. And that that is true for all of our communities and people we love and the planet we live on. But that is going to require, uh, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, changing one thing, everything. Changing one thing, just everything. See, it's not that bad. It's not that hard. All you have to do is change everything. Just one thing on your to-do list. When you put it that way, it sounds almost routine, 
we're just going to put it on, put it on a sticky note, just change everything. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I think that's wonderful uh, marching, uh, marching orders uh, to lead us into uh, the present and the future. It's been lovely speaking to y'all. I needed this. Uh, so for me personally, thank you, Teresa and Andrea and Marsha for putting us together. Thank you to everyone who joined us. It's been a real treat. And I want to thank you all so much. This was empowering and sobering all at once. It was the most welcoming expression of an invitation to join the work that I can imagine uh, in an hour conversation. Um, and I, I, such a fitting way to celebrate the Ms. Foundation for Women's 50th anniversary. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank all of you for joining us. Uh, and I hope everyone has a great night. Good night. Thank you.